enough time, I don't think, to do more. So, uh, because I, I want to, with this giant series, this is different than my other ones that I've done before. First of all, these have, uh, it's more illustrated with the pictures and things like that. But also, this is, I didn't include a lot of information that I included in the first one. And the reason why is because I've come to not really believe most of that, or I shouldn't say I don't believe it. I should say that some of it was more conjecture, and um, you could see a reasonable theory that it could, some of that could be true in that sense. But this, I believe, is more scriptural. I, I, I believe that as, as God has showed me things and in just following the Bible itself will this afternoon we'll explain more of the origin of the Giants we'll explain kind of uh, a few of the theories and things that are that are in there um, are that are scriptural I believe and I'm going to show you some interesting things that I didn't have in any of the other teachings that I've done before that the Lord kind of revealed unto me so I, I'm going to through the Bible that is not some extra biblical revelation I didn't hit my head I didn't have right. bad gas right. and I didn't get taken up in the, into some kind of weird spirit and speak like really weird languages it was really just God showed me from the scriptures you understand the difference in that right like I'm not going off my emotions and my feelings this morning I'm not taking it well this is what I feel like well, really, I didn't come up here to tell you what I feel like, right? And you didn't come here to hear what I feel like. Isn't that right? You came to hear the Word of God. Amen. I hope anyway. And if you didn't, well, God will straighten you out. Amen. Amen. But, uh, but that's just the truth of the matter. I don't want to, we're not, we're not talking about some charismatic feeling here. I'm saying God reveals things in His Word. I'm not talking about look at, I'm not talking about the Kabbalists that, that, that look in between the words into the white parts of the pages and get little visions and little, little trances and little uh, uh, weird, uh, what do you call it, Tri uh, acid trips and uh, strange weird things. No, I'm talking about the scriptures here. We're going to look at Bible today, amen? Because that's the only thing that's going to help you grow. By the way, that'll be the one thing sometimes you want to resist too. I'm feeling a little feisty this morning. I'll be honest with you. I just am. So um, just a little bit. I, I am, Brother Paul. I'm, I'm just feeling a little feisty this morning. I, don't, I, just, I, I know Satan hates the Bible, and I know Satan hates the Word of God. And you know what? I know that people, some of us, if we don't want to be right with God, we'll resist the truth. And I don't mean about giants. I mean about your Christian life. But there's some giants there, too. We'll talk about them. All right, anyway, so we're going to get started here, and uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 6 here. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 4, the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You gotta be careful with that thing of your imagination. You gotta be careful of that. You know, one thing that I that, that God taught me through severe depression and anxiety and other things is that you know what? Your imagination can get the best of you if you're not careful. I mean, you'll start evil surmising, you'll start imagining all kinds of things. Right. That you say, well, this is about giants. I know it is. But but your 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 imagination could be a big old ugly giant that you run with. And 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 you can think up some really, really, really crazy things in your mind that aren't even accurate and aren't even true. You'll start accusing people of things they never did. You'll start accusing people of thinking things about you. They don't even think about you. Isn't that something how that works. See, that's a Baptist preacher right there. You take God's word and you look at that and you say, well, that's talking about giants. I know it's talking about you too. <laughs> it's talking about all of us, isn't it? God gives us, God has something for everybody. That's what the word of God does. Amen. All right, so let's pray first. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do for us. We pray you bless us now. Guide our steps and help us, Lord. Satan wants to destroy God's people. He wants to distract them. He wants to remove them. Uh, he wants to keep them far from the truth. He wants them to be discouraged and down. And Lord, we just pray that the word of God would ring forth in our hearts today that would feed our souls and our minds and our hearts and help us to walk with you in the spirit of holiness and truth and in righteousness. And Lord, for those that are lost here today that have never been saved, may they come to Christ who is no life everlasting to know the, the gift of God, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
All right, so we are going to talk about these giants here today, and we're going to show you the scriptural basis for giants, all right, what the Bible says about them. So there's some things that we're going to explain. You know, the Bible talks about these giants. It also says people wonder the pre-flood, post-flood giants. Where did they come from? We're, we'll talk more about that this afternoon. But this Bible verse does say uh, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. So there's two times. That and also after that is dealing with after the original invasion of giants. Right? That's what it's talking about. So, uh, and I'll share with you some of those other things later. But these giants explain quite a bit of things to us. They explain why God ordered the Israelites to wipe out the nations of Canaan. I want you to think about that for a second because a lot of people accuse God. That's, by the way, man is very good at accusing God. They never want to accuse themselves, but they're very good at accusing God. And what man wants to do is, is look at the Old Testament and say, See, the God of the Bible can't be true because the Old Testament God must be different than the New Testament God. Or, or there must be some kind of confusion because God went in there and told the Israelites, Go in there and wipe them out. Well, there's a reason God told them to do that. There's a very good reason why God told them to do that. The good reason God told them to do that is because there were a bunch of giants in the land, which I'm going to show you, and most of those people were all, were all hybrids, and they were all mixed, and they were, many of them were devil-worshipping people that hated God, and that land belonged to Israel, right? They were murderous people. That as soon as the Israelites went in there, they would have murdered them. They would have murdered the Israelites. God knew that. Plus, that land was promised, and Satan had had filled that land with giants, but we'll talk about that. We'll actually show you that. I don't know if I'll get to that this morning, but we'll see. Uh, these giants explain how all flesh had corrupted itself before the Lord. Brother Paul, it's interesting, Brother Paul put out an article about, uh, about uh, a modern-day Soylent Green being people and how they're making uh, meat out of human flesh and they're mixing it. And people wonder, well, how could all flesh corrupt itself before the Lord? Well, that's a good example, isn't it? Yeah, see, you, people, people think America's a Christian nation. No, this world's full of pagans. It's a pagan nation. It's exactly what it is. Yeah, it is. Right. That, well, no, that's what it is, is it's the, height of, it's the height of men shall be lovers of their own selves. The end times. The Bible talks about that. That's one of the most dangerous things. Boy, you get a man that, that when they're lovers of their own selves, right, more than lovers of God, oh, man, you can't imagine the evil that can come of that. The Bible shows us, though, when you're, when you're a lover of your own self, how evil that actually can be. Uh, the giants explain why certain angels are bound and others are not. That's another thing, because the Bible says, well, you, you wonder about the devil's activity in the world today, right? You wonder, like, well, how does that work exactly? You know, um, some of those angels, are all angels bound? No, all angels, are, all fallen angels are not bound. In fact, there's scripture in the New Testament that proves that angels are still falling today. That there are still angels that are falling, that, that we are an example. And Jesus, his, his death, burial, and resurrection uh, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Amen. The resurrection triumphs over, over them. So anyway, and we're meant for, to be an example to them. The church. This church, the local New Testament church, is meant to be an example, is meant to be to show them the truth of God's word in this world today. Boy, I hope your life's doing that. Amen. I hope that's what we're doing. I hope that's what we're trying to do, that our life shows that. Amen. That's important. That's, a, that's, that's a, an examination of ourselves and to say, you know what? I hope that my life is doing that, that I'm showing the triumph of Christ. This life is a life of victory. Amen. It is a life of victory. Absolutely. So anyway, that's, that, those are some of the things that, that, that why this is important. Some men don't like to talk about this at all. They really don't cover it. They kind of skip over it. Um, I had one preacher, friend of mine, good friend of mine, but he, he said, you know, I don't, I don't really talk too much about that stuff. Well, you know what? The, the Bible says that when Jesus is coming back, if you're going to talk about the coming of Christ, right, that in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That, and, and when you see all these things come to pass, and what are we seeing? Things like in the days of Noah. But we'll save that for when we really talk, we get to that point, okay? But what we're not going to use again, 
We are not going to use the, the missing books of the Bible. We are not going to use, which there are none, by the way. Um, there are no missing books of Scripture that, that we don't have that, that we're in search of today. No, this is complete and whole, and we have need of nothing. This is it right here. Uh, this King James Bible. Uh, we are not, we not going to use the book of Enoch to try to prove our point uh, about giants, the existence of giants. Uh, there's another book uh, on the giants that, that Enoch wrote, uh, or that Enoch didn't write, but they, the, the, the fake guy, whoever that Enoch was, <laughs> wrote. Uh, some devil named Enoch wrote it, uh, but it wasn't the Enoch from the scriptures because the Bible never tells us that Enoch wrote anything, all right? But they call it the book of Enoch, they call it the book of giants, and they talk about giants, and they, they deal with them specifically uh, in different names and different things like that. Uh, should we trust any of those resources? No, absolutely not. Why would we? We, don't ha we, we certainly don't need them to prove anything. We don't, need, we don't need any of those resources to prove anything. And, um, you know, we definitely don't need the, the, um, the flat earth theory there. Uh, we don't need that to prove anything uh, because that, all that proves is, well, stupidity. Anyway, but uh, uh, I'll move on. Here's our authority, right? Right there. That's our authority, that King James Bible. That's everything that we want to teach today, everything that, that you need to focus on for your life, everything that's going to help you grow as a Christian, uh, everything that is profitable unto you is right there in that book, right there, right? That's the, the Bible that you hold, the book that you hold in your hands is the authority in all matters. It's the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. By the way, if that's not, and your feelings are, and your visions, and your spirits, and your thoughts, and, and everything else, don't wonder why you get a little messed up. Because if you're trusting in the way you feel, and what you think, and what you think God is revealing to you, but it doesn't match this right there, you better chuck out the way you feel. You better chuck out the things that you think God is teaching you because what God is teaching you is found right there. That's what God is teaching you. That's why the Bible says to try the spirits whether they have God. You want to end up being silly? You go ahead and follow the spirits and the things that you think God is teaching you that are not found written and, 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 uh, and taught in the scriptures. But, but go off the way that you feel or what you think God is trying to teach. You know, I went through a period of time where I was challenged so much by, by what, what I thought God was trying to teach me and what, what I thought was going on in my life. But I never gave in to any of it by God's grace. And the reason why I never gave in to it, because I had this book and God said, I'm going to make you want this right here. You're going to want this right here more than you want anything else, more than you trust your own feelings, more than you trust what you think God is trying to say to you. Why don't you just read what God is trying to say to you? Right? Why don't you just follow sound scripture instead of your silly, foolish notions? Amen. Because if you follow this, you already know what God is saying to you. But see, your feelings will always try to contradict, contradict what this says. Many times. Or to misapply this. One of the greatest mistakes Christians make is to misapply the Word of God. By the way, you know what the dangerous thing in preaching is? Not dangerous in the sense of it's bad, but, but what happens to the hearer? Many times the people that are to apply the things that they hear to the specific situation do not. And then many times those that do apply the situation to their circumstances misapply them. Right? So if, so if they've been saved by the grace of God and there's breathing and threatenings that go out in the scriptures, they automatically apply them to them, but they neglect to apply the, the, the grace of God and the blessings of God that are found in the scriptures. That's the danger on both sides. But listen, people are going to mock us for many things. I, I don't want to be mocked by, I don't want to be mocked for using the book of Enoch. <laughs> I don't want to be mocked for that. But I will be mocked for this book. I, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm okay with suffering reproaches, mockings, scoffings, and hatred for this book. You ought to be too. Amen. To accept it for believing what God said. For accepting what God said, because we, we are counted as fools. But be a fool for Christ's sake, not for the book of Enoch. Be a fool for, for the truth, not for your feelings. Right? 
every reference to giants in the King James Bible, we're going to go through, but we won't get to that in this lesson, because here's the thing that I'm going to do. We're going to get to this lesson, then we're going to get to the one Lord willing in the afternoon, and then next week, I want to bring to you uh, another one of these, but I want to deal with Dave, King David versus the giants, because David didn't fight just one giant. He didn't fight just Goliath, although that's the most famous one is Goliath. I want to talk about and describe some of those giants, their stature, the things that they did. So, and by the way, the, the pictures of David as, as a type of Christ, I want to go through all that. And I, want, I think now is a good time to do that when we're talking about giants because of what, what Goliath pictures. And the other giants, Goliath wasn't the only giant that David fought. David fought many giants in the land. That were there. And it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that these giants were left over, and then at the end, David, late years later, after Joshua settles the land and they get into the land, years later, uh, David, a man after God's own heart, rises up. I mean, Saul's not fighting the giants. Saul was scared to fight the giants. Saul ran back in the tent. Saul was, he wouldn't fight the giant. He was afraid of him, right? But David the type of Christ David does. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to, those other giants that we find there, because there's other tribes that are there. But today you're going to learn a lot about how many giants actually were in the land. You're going to understand from some maps and from some other things exactly what was going on there. Because we have such a narrow mindset of what was going on there that you could think, well, there was only like three or four giants running around there. So there's no reason why God had to wipe out all those giants. Like that's not even right. Why did he kill all those people and why did he do all those other things? And they, by the way, if God did it, God's right anyway. But you just don't understand God's reasoning of why he did it. But I want to help you to understand that a little bit today. And that, so you can share that with other people, right? By the way, if you deny the truth of the sons of God, daughters of men, the giants and everything else, most of the time you have no answer. You just say, well, God just said wipe them all out. God just wanted to kill everybody. That's just what God wanted. And the God of the New Testament is different. So Jesus said, be nice. But the God of the Old Testament said, kill everybody. Wait, that doesn't sound accurate, does it? No, because it's not accurate. That's not who God is, and that's not what was going on. It's a misrepresentation of God. That's why these topics are important to cover. Amen. It's important to cover that. It's important to cover seeming contradictions that people have, which we're going to get to one today. We'll look at one of those. It's important to cover those. Why? Because you need to know that this book, that number one, God's right. Amen. And number two, God's nature, he's consistent. God is consistent. Amen. He never changes. God, the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the Amen. New Testament. And this, does, this story doesn't change who God is at all. Right. It doesn't change who he is. In fact, it explains more who he is. That's right. Okay, the context, we're going to look at the, also the context surrounding each text in the, in the King James Bible. The built-in dictionary or explanations that are in the King James Bible that explain everything. God's word explains exactly... Uh, the message that God has for us. So it's, it's simple when you understand what God is saying. Now, that guy is ugly. He, look at that big head, and look at that small guy. So the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children, and the same became mighty men of which were of old men of renown. Now, I, I want to say something to you here when you look at this. This is like, this is a comparison. Um, Possibly it would be a better comparison of a, of a pre-flood giant, but I just want you to think about this for a second. Because you have an average man that's going to be six feet tall or whatever, and then you have this man who's like three times that size. That's pretty accurate, actually, representation of, of, of what was there. Now imagine you're going into the land, and imagine that's what you see. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's pretty scary, isn't it? Some of you are saying, that's what my dad looks like when he wakes up in the morning. But that, that, that might be true, right? I, I've heard some, you know, some grunting going on when people wake up, some men wake up in the morning, they sound, sound like that probably, right? Paul, you got to get up on Monday morning, go to work, you probably grunt a little bit, right? Might sound like that a little bit, but, but you just don't have that stature, right? This is what they faced. When you think about the giants, it's, it's kind of interesting, isn't it, when you think about that? 
when you think about them, uh, when, when Israel's going into the land uh, later, which we're going to get to here, because we kind of have to. See, I merged this kind of together different from my other one before for a reason, for a purpose, because I want to teach you something. Doesn't he look like Andre the Giant, kind of? He kind of does. That's what Scott was thinking. Weren't you, Scott? You were probably thinking that. You're looking at his face. He kind of looks like Andre the Giant a little bit. Look at that. Yeah, he was a wrestler. Yeah, don't ask me how I knew that. All right. The next time we see giants mentioned, though, here's where we see them. In Numbers chapter 13. So you have Genesis chapter 6, right? You have God destroying the earth in Genesis chapter 9. Uh, we're not going to get into Nimrod in Genesis chapter 11. We'll save that. Uh, we will talk about him a little bit later at the end. But I decided, Lord willing, that to my days of Noah and those other things, I'm probably going to add something on Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. Because there is a connection there that I, I, I kind of want to talk about a little bit. But we'll save that. We're going to probably have about three or four weeks of this. Um, maybe actually longer, maybe about a month or so, uh, a little bit longer, month or maybe six weeks. But the reason why is because I want to show you a few things. And I really feel led of the Lord that where I was in Joshua was a perfect place to stop at the time. And it just seemed like it. And this is the way the Lord's leading. Amen. So I, I'm thankful for that. Numbers chapter 13. Now we're going to talk about numbers a bit, but Numbers chapter 13, verse number 31. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. Sound familiar? And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the, the giants. There it says here, there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak which come of the giants. I think that phrase is interesting because when you stop and think about the wording of that, what he says here, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. There's a history there. There's a, there's a genealogy there, right? And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Some things about this, and we'll go back to the scripture in a second. The next time we see the giants, though, what we see, we see them mentioned along with Israel's rebellion. The number 13 is the number for rebellion. But we talk, we're talking about giants here, right? Yeah, but we're talking about God's people, too. Because I want you to notice something. <coughs> Excuse me. The giants aren't the only ones that, were, that are rebellion, in rebellion here. You know, one of, the, one of the dangerous things that you can do is, is be fighting against the enemies of the Lord and be rebellious yourself. These men were rebellious, right? Scripture says, scripture says that they, they, they said we are not able to go up against them. They'd be mightier than we. Now, never, number one, they weren't supposed to make that judgment call because God said he was going to destroy them. He was going to use, the, he was gonna use uh, Israel to destroy those giants, and, and God was going to get the victory. God promised them the land. See, you've been promised eternal life. You that are saved by the grace of God, you've been promised eternal life, but God said you've got to get up and fight. You've got to fight every day. Right? You've got to fight the giants that are in your life, right? You've got to fight those challenges that you have. You're, you're to go into the land of Canaan and you're to possess this land. You're to, you're to work it. You're to fight. You're to continue to, to press on in that land against all, every foe that comes your way spiritually, right? But these men didn't want to do that. They became afraid. You know what? Your fear. Your fear, if you give in to your fear, will cause you to sin. You know, the Bible warns us about fear, and the reason it warns us about fear is because if we give in to fear, then we will not fight. Right? 
you'll dig your heels in and you'll stop growing as a Christian. You won't listen to good, strong advice. You'll be stiff-necked and hard-hearted just like these men were. Oh, pastor, we're not like these guys. If we were facing those giants, we'd go into the land and we'd do this. We wouldn't be stiff-necked and rebellious. We would never be hard-hearted against instructions from God. We would never be hard-hearted against the preacher preaching the Bible to us and instructing us and helping us to grow and, and teaching us what God expects. We would never buck against that. <laughs> After all, it's, it would be counterproductive. Well, of course it is. You know the greatest challenge that a pastor has, one of the greatest challenges a pastor has, is instructing, with meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. I mean, you can't imagine you're sitting in front of somebody and you're, or you're preaching and you're trying to help people and, and they're opposing their own selves and they think they're opposing you and you're like, you're not opposing me, you're opposing yourself. You're opposing God. I mean, I just, I'm just representing what God wants me to do. I'm just preaching what God wants me to do. If you oppose what's being preached to you and it's the truth of the gospel, it's the truth of the Bible, it's the truth for you and holy living and, and to live right for God and to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life, I mean, you're... You're opposing yourself. But trying to explain to somebody in meekness, trying to instruct somebody in meekness, not to lose patience with them. Do you know that's really one of the biggest challenges? Is that when people blatantly ignore, don't follow the scriptures, don't obey them, and they're opposing their own self. And you're trying to help them. That's a challenge not to get frustrated. That's why you have to pray for your pastor. <laughs> That's why you have to pray for me. Because <laughs> I'll be honest with you, there have been times that I've lost patience with people. There, there have been those times. And the Lord smote me for it. And he dealt with me for it. Because above all else, a pastor has to be patient. He has to be patient. He has to be patient. And I'll be honest with you, there have been times that, 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 I, that I haven't been, <laughs> right? That I've been stretched out and I've been like, oh, right? Why? Because you watch people, it's frustrating to watch people destroy themselves. <laughs> it, it's, it breaks your heart too. It's not that you, it's because you're emotionally and spiritually invested in their success. And then you watch them destroy themselves. It's very difficult. It's hard to explain. I guess it's not that hard to explain. If you're a mother or a father, you understand. When you watch your children knowingly go the wrong way, you can understand that, right? How much that, but to continue, you know, to, to help them. So anyway, here's these men, right? God's promised them the land to fight these giants. God said, you know what? You're going you're gonna to get victory. You just go into that land and you just take it. See, God, do you think God knew the giants were there already? Well, yeah, he didn't send them in there to say, hey, these guys are big and scary. They already knew it. God already knew it, right? But we see that Israel, they didn't want to fight the giants. They didn't want to take the inheritance. How many times are you and I like that in our own lives? We don't grow spiritually because we, observe, we forsake our own mercies by observing lying vanities. You might say to yourself, well, that's not me, Pastor. That's somebody else. That's my neighbor. That's Dave. Mm -hmm. Dave's got to be the one to do that, right? That's not me. That, that can be all of us at different times in our Christian life. That we, we won't, you know what? We might think that we're pretty smart or we know the Bible or we can memorize facts or we can, you know, dictionaries have a lot of facts, but that doesn't mean that dictionaries are walking in the spirit, right? Computers can give you access to any facts that you want. That doesn't mean that you scripturally are applying those to your life and living for God every day. Right? Amen. You know what I care? I don't care what you know. I care what you do. That you follow God. Right? Because here's these Israelites, and guess what? They got into rebellion so bad, they didn't want to fight the giants. They wanted to fight Caleb. They wanted to fight Joshua. They wanted to stone Moses. And that's what happens. If you don't want to be right with God, you'll want to stone the preacher. Yeah. You better believe you will. 
Man, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. You'll want to stone the preacher if, you don't, if you're not right with God. Man, you'll be like, hey, I'm going to find some fault with that preacher. Well, that ain't hard to do. Go ahead and find fault with my God, not me. Amen. It ain't hard to find fault with me. I'm a man. Surely you can find fault with me. We, we're good at it. We're Baptists. We can find fault with anybody. Right? But you can't find any fault with God. Amen. And you can't find any fault with God's word. So why don't you just obey it? Amen. But they didn't want to. And what happened? They got into rebellion. They rebelled against God. They said, we're not going to go into that land and fight the land. They would rather rebel than to wage war out of fear. By the way, I don't say it's malicious intent either. I think a lot of times people get afraid. They get full of fear and they don't want to follow. They don't want to do what's right. Why? Because they're afraid. They just have to admit that it's fear that's keeping them. But by the way, Paul warned us about that fear. He said, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear. Paul said, don't let anything move you from the truth. Don't let anything move you from obedience. You know what? You might have a heart full of fear here today, but if you're continuing to obey God, if you're listening to the instructions that God has given you, and you're continuing to fight the good fight of faith, and you're respecting the authority that God has given you, you're following this book, guess what? That fear's not going to take you. And then you can identify where it's coming from. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So that's not coming from the Lord. Right? What, what, what Satan means for evil, God means for good. You turn, God will take that fear if you take it to him and he'll sanctify it and he'll turn it into faith and he'll strengthen you. That's what God does. That's why you're supposed to take all your fears to God. Amen? Look at what they said about them, the giants. Look what they said. Boy, this is a lot more preachy than, than it was when I was putting these slides together. This is, I don't know, really. It's just the Lord. Uh, that's what happened, right? He's what happened. Look at this. They, were, they said, we're like grasshoppers. Look at that fellow's feet. Anyway, uh, Numbers 13, 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the sons of Anak there, the children of Anak there. Numbers 13, 33, and there we saw the giants. That always reminds me, and there I was. <laughs> anyway, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. Look what they said. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. These men were big. There, there's no doubt about it. With your challenges in your life, they're big. I'm not trying to minimize your challenges. I'm trying to maximize your sight of God for you to understand that God is bigger than all those things. I'm not trying to minimize your fear here today. I'm not trying to minimize the, the trials that you're going through. No, I'm trying to maximize your appreciation for God. I'm trying to get you to understand how big your God is. I'm trying to get you to understand that you need to trust your God and not the size of your problem or your challenge there because God's bigger than all of it. Amen. And you have to understand that deliverance and defeating giants doesn't mean that God slays them right away. Sometimes you've got to deal with them. Sometimes you're going to be in a war for a while. You're going to fight. And the only way you can fight is if you get somebody big to fight. And that's the way it happens. But these men, they said, we're like grasshoppers. They went to the land and they saw those sons of Anak. And they were like, man, we got some big old grapes, but we saw some big old giants. And they are huge. I mean, that's the comparison of a grasshopper. Look at the foot of that guy, right? That's what they felt like. By the way, you probably feel that way sometimes too with the challenges you have in your life. And instead of obedience, maybe you choose fear. Those guys are ugly. I've seen some people like that before. Anyway, those guys are big, aren't they? I I'm thinking here's Caleb, right? <laughs> he's, got his, he's, got his, he's got his staff in his hand right here. And here's these sons of Anak, right? They're, whoa. Right? That's the picture. What, like, he's like, uh-oh. But Caleb wasn't afraid. Caleb was like, I'm ready to fight. Amen. Man, Caleb had to go around the wilderness for 40 years because those guys didn't fight. For, man, he was mad. You can't tell me he wasn't mad. Not mad at God, but he was mad at them. <laughs> it's like Caleb's walking around. For 40 years around that wilderness, like circling the wilderness for like 40 
years. He's like, and the only thing on Caleb's mind, and we find later in the scripture, the only thing on his mind is I'm going up to that mountain and I'm kicking every single one of them out. They are gone. That is my mountain. I want that mountain. It belongs to me. And I'm going and I'm getting that mountain. And I don't care how big they are. When I see them, I am plucking them off that mountain. All of them are getting out of my land. And that's how you got to fight this Christian life. Your challenges, your trials, and your th- you got to fight them just like Caleb did those giants. But the size of these men, this is, this is the size difference that you're talking You're not talking about, you're talking about three to four to five times a normal man's size that they fought. They were big men. They were big men, at least three times, possibly. Israelites weren't really big men anyway. They, they weren't big men. So let's say they were five, seven, five, eight, or something like that, and these men were 15 feet tall. We don't know exactly how tall they were. Um, We have some indications. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Well, there were giants, right? When they went through some of those lands, in fact, oh, God, oh, I know when I'm going to do that. When I talk about giant structures, I'm going to show you some, some pictures and some things. But when they went into the cities of Bashan, when they went in there, some of, the, some of the people went into those cities back in the 1800s. I have a book somewhere over here. Anyway, they no, I think it's online. I have it. Uh, they went into some of the cities of Bashan, and the doors were doors that were like, twice the size or three times the size of normal doors that they had found in Bashan. Yeah, same thing. That's who they were. But think about this, though. They fenced their cities up to the size of what they were, not to the size of what they're in it, of, of what normal man were. So that's why when they looked at it, God says they're fenced up to heaven. They think they got it covered. Just like, what does that remind you of? The Tower of Babel. They wanted to build that, they wanted to build that ziggurat, right? They wanted to build that all the way to heaven, right? So yeah, it's the same concept. And a people, but what did God tell them? He said, no, uh, Moses is telling us in Deuteronomy, the re-giving of the law, they're about ready to go into the land. He said, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest. You know who they are. You remember those guys. Whom thou knowest and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? That's what they said. Who can stand? That was what they said. Anybody that was in the land, what they said was, who can stand before them? They're humongous men. But God has some instructions for them. Understand, therefore, this day, that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. As a consuming fire, he shall destroy them and shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said unto thee. God said, you're going you're gonna to drive them out and you're going to destroy them, which is exactly what happened. But God gives a warning about, about that. He says, speak not thou in thine heart after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, for my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But... For the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. And that they may perform, that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. By the way, you were saved because of the promise of God, and you are still saved because of the promise of God. You are not saved because of your own righteousness. You are not saved because of good things that you've done in your life. You are not saved for any good works, because not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. You are not still saved today through all your trials because because you you did a good job. Your salvation has never been dependent upon your own righteousness. If it ever was, then it's not real. Amen. Amen. And God would show that. You wouldn't have any fruit. You wouldn't be able to sustain. Right? But the reason you do have fruit is because God grows the seed that he plants in your heart. 
when He saves you. The gospel seed, he, he, he grows it in your heart, and He continues to raise you up in that way, amen, and to teach you. But God says, I just want to remind you when all this victory comes, that you don't get a big head like those giants and think that I did this because you were such good people. But that's a good reminder, isn't it? After we get saved by the grace of God, years down the road, sometimes we start thinking more of our sanctification than God's justification, than what God's done in our heart. We start thinking we're pretty, well, we're pretty good people, right? We start thinking that, uh, you know, God saved us from a lot of stuff, but, you know, we're, we're, we live pretty good. And, we're doing that. And, and God reminds you, wait a minute, don't forget that the only reason why you inherited any of this is because of my promises, because of my righteousness, because of who I am, amen, not because of who you are. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that a blessing to know that in, it, when the sun shines or when it's dark as hell outside, that, that it's, it's God's righteousness always. When you're in a good mood or when you're in a bad mood, when all hell breaks loose in your life or, or the sun shines like the heaven, you know what? We can remember that it's all about Jesus. It's all about what He's done for us. It's all about His victory and what He's done for us. Amen? But these sons of Enoch, they, were, they sound like they're pretty ugly fellas. Look at that guy's head. Um, and look at the size difference here when you see that, right? They're like, man, that guy is humongous. Um, anyway, but think about this, right? So here's these sons of Enoch. They're going into the land. There they are, and they're all ugly. Uh, and, uh, but where did they come from? That's a good question. We're going to look a little bit at that tribe there. We're going to, we're going to, the reason why is because we're, when we go through the scriptures, it talks a lot about these sons of Enoch. They are the, the Anakims are the ones that... Uh, they're the ones that are talked about probably the most out of any giants, besides the most famous giant, Goliath, who's kind of like a giant's little brother, because uh, he's really not the size of these guys, I don't believe. Uh, but but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit more. But these sons of Anak, they were big men. They were big creatures, I should say. Um, and they have an origin that's kind of interesting. But let's look at, look at a clue here, because uh, this will give you a clue as to where they come from. Because you wonder, after the flood, where did these giants come from? We know that. Well, the Bible says, and also after that. So there was another group of, giant, uh, group of angels, fallen angels, that did the same thing. Right? Joshua 21, 11. And they gave them the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron, in the hill country, of Judah with the suburbs thereof round about it. And the name of Hebron was Kerjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. Now, it does not say that Arba was a giant. It does say that he fathered a number of giants, the sons of Anak, right? That he fathered them, but it does say that Arba was a great man. So I'm going to give you a little hint as to my theory here. I believe that Arba was a fallen angel. I do believe that he was. I do believe that he settled. Look where he settled, which we're going to talk about this afternoon. He settled around Hebron, right? Judah, that's right. Uh, he settled around there. And then you have, obviously, you have Caleb that's going to uh, have a day of reckoning with these giants, right? And you have, but Arba, this is, this is tell, detailing the land and who gets it and who doesn't get it and what they get and how they get it and what their borders are and everything else. Well, Arba, the city Kerjath Arba, was named after him. And the Anakims, the sons of Anak, those giants filled that land. There, there were three of them, and then there was children of Anak. So there were children, there were other giants that were born of them. But the three sons of Anak would have fathered many of those giants, probably, that were in the land at the time. Uh, and we, we don't know everything about that. But Joshua 15, 13 says, And unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua. Even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron? So Arba, Arba is a great man there, right? He's, he's held in high regard there. They call him a great man. Angels come as a, in the form of a man, right? The giants aren't really called men. They're called giants, right? The sons of Anak, right? That's what they're called. This guy is called a great man. I believe that he is one of the fallen angels that populated, and I'll get to that later on this afternoon, that populated Canaan. 
There was a purpose to populate Canaan. As soon as they found out that's where God was sending Abraham, they said, now it's time to move. And they populated that entire area with giants. That's what they did. Uh, those, I believe there's four of them. I'm going to show you who I think they are. Anyway, but, but here we have the father of Anak. Here we have the city of Hebron, which is interesting because David ruled and reigned in the city of Hebron, didn't he, for seven years, right? Remember that? David ruled and reigned there. See, these are all pictures of the Antichrist, pictures of Christ versus the Antichrist and the battle and the war that was to come. But Caleb drove, Caleb, and Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai and Ahimon and Talmai, the children of Anak. He drove them out of the mountain. And later we'll find out what he does with them. But, but they drive them out of the mountain, right? You're getting out of here, right? So he drove them thence from the land of Hebron, the mountain that was there, and he took it for his own. And Caleb couldn't wait to do it. He wanted to fight. And oh to, oh to God that we would have that same spirit today, that the Lord would give us all the same spirit to want to fight like that. Amen? Caleb drove out the sons of Anak. Judges chapter 1, verse number 20. These two verses to some people contradict each other. Let's look at 10 first. And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron before was Kerjath Arba. And they slew Shishai and Ahimon and Talmai. And then Judges 1, 20 says, And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled the three sons of Anak. Well, one is, there's no contradiction there. One of them is saying that Caleb took the possession of the land personally, his personal inheritance, and he kicked out the giants. And then when he kicked them out, all of Judah gathered up together and killed them. There you go. I mean, it's not, it's not hard. The tribe's duty was to, was to kill them and destroy them, right? Caleb's duty was to pluck them out of the mountains and pluck them out of the area and get them out of there and say, well, that's mine. I'm plucking them out. And then the whole tribe was in charge of killing them, all of them and slaying them. There's no contradiction there. It's just different accounts of what took place. One is more specific than the other. See, if you want to see a contradiction in the Bible, you can make one up in your mind. Right. Come on. But if you just go scripture to scripture, you can, it explains it right there. Right. It's, just, it's just detailing two different things. That's why all the contradictions are in the scriptures in people's minds like that, right? They're contradictions. They're all in their brains. They, they're, there's not really any, any at all. These sons of Anak were not the only giants in the land, though. I'm going to show you a map here. It's kind of interesting when we get to this map. But they were not the only giants. There were a number of tribes of giants all over Canaan, and I'm going to show you that. Because, see, in people's mind, again, there's like, oh, there's three or four giants. What's the big deal? You know, I mean, yeah, they're huge and everything. There's, no, they populated the area. They filled the area. Deuteronomy 2.10 says the Emims dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. Meaning there was more than one or more than just those three children of Anak. There were the Anakims, which were an entire tribe of giants. Okay. But these Emims also, and not Imams, if you're thinking Islam, but, um, but these Imams dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. So there's another tribe of them, a whole tribe. They go into the land and they're like, whoa. You mean the sons of Enoch are not the only ones? No, the whole land is filled with them. That's what people don't get. They, they think it's just like, it was just the Anakims. Well, it's just the Anakims. It was just the sons of Enoch. They were the scary ones. No, there were tribes of them everywhere. Okay, so here he says again, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims. But the Moabites call them Emims. The Horims, okay, so there's the other ones. There's the Horims. The Horims also dwelt in Zaire before, before time from the children of Esau. But the children of Esau, excuse me, succeeded them when they had destroyed them before them, from before them and dwelt in their stead. And Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. Now, this is interesting. Okay, because there's something here with that. Not that guy. Um, we'll get back to him. Here's what I want to show you. Okay, this is a land of the giants. Okay, uh, what you're going to see is the different tribes of giants here. Now, let me explain something to you. God, when, 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 um, when, when the Israelites went to go into the land, when they saw uh, the Israelites, when the Israelites saw the, the children of Esau, 
They said, God said, pass, pass by them. Don't fight with them. I gave them their land and you don't have to fight those giants that are there. Watch this. You don't have to fight uh, the Horems. Why? Because I already equipped Esau to kill them. God promised that land to Esau, the children of Esau. See, Israel wasn't the only one that was promised land. Amen. Esau was also promised land. God said, this will be your land. I will give you this land and no one's going to take it from you. So the giants that populate in that area, the children of Esau warred against them. They succeeded them. They destroyed them and dwelt in their stead under the land in that possession, which the Lord gave unto them. See, God gave it to them. So that tribe of giants, Israel didn't have to worry about, but they were there. They were really there and he wiped them out. Now, when you, the Horems, those were the Horems and then the Emums, they were in the land of Moab. And what did God say about the land of Moab? That was given to who? Lot and his children. So Israel, he said, don't meddle with them. You leave them alone. And when you see, and those giants that were there, God allowed the Moabites to kill them. Or if they messed with Israel, God would kill them. But they were counted giants. And they were there in the land. And no doubt they probably gave Israel a hard time uh, if they weren't uh, eradicated until later. Um, but imagine a land of giants. Because that's what it was. See, when you get the perception, you're thinking, okay, so there was like one or two or three giants in the land. Uh, no, there wasn't. There were, this is the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan. He was a giant king, which we're going to talk about. I think we'll almost get to that. Um, Og, king of Bashan. He was right there. All right. Uh, that's his kingdom. All right. Here you have Sion, who was also a giant king, which we're going to talk about. He was a giant as well. Sion was a king and he was a giant. And here's the Zuzims right there. Okay. Then you have over here, you have Arba and Anak down here by Hebron, right? So Arba, Anak, you have the Emims right here in Moab. You have the giants that were here, right here. You have the Anakims that were confined to this area. The whole land was filled with giants. All of them. Everywhere they went. It's kind of like your Christian life. You think, you think sometimes that your Christian life is just going to be like this easy map and it's supposed to be just a, this, it's this easy road uh, to, it's like an easy road to the celestial city. Well, I got saved now, so everything's going to go great. No, you got saved now and you're given armor and you're supposed to join a local New Testament church, put that armor on and get into the fight. Amen. And you're, you're going to, you're got to fight. And the, the greatest giant that you're going to fight is the one in, your, in the mirror. Yeah, amen. Because you're going to oppose yourself more than anybody opposes right. you. Yep. You bet. Definitely. You're, you're going to oppose yourself and more than anybody does. But this is a good picture because everywhere you go, man, there's a war to fight. There's a battle to fight. This whole land was full of, a, of warfare. All of it was. All of it. What's that? It was the land of milk and honey. Isn't that something? Because think about that. It, it, God called it the land of milk and honey, right? It was the promised land, the land of milk and honey that was given to them. But guess what? They were going to fight. They were going to war. You, you as Christians are as saved by the grace of God. You're in the land of milk and honey, but it's Amen. a war. Right. It's a fight. Come on. That, I mean, it, it's warfare. Mm. It's, not, it's not easy. No. Right? It's not time to rest. No. It's time to fight. Amen. Your rest will come when you get to the promised land, when you get home, right? When you get to the celestial city, that's when rest comes. Here comes warfare, and they're everywhere. And, and now this, this gives you a better idea when you see how many of them are in the land. It gives you a better idea of what the battle was like for them, like every place they turned, just like you. Every place you turn. right? Uh, one, there, there's a hymn in our book, towards the end of the book, it says, Every day is a war. Every day is a battle. That's true. It is. Every day. Deuteronomy 2.18 Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, this day. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them. 
For I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for possession. That also was accounted the land of giants. Dwelt, giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumims. What a name. Zamzumims. Say that fast. A people great and many and tall as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead, as he did the children of Esau, which dwelt in Zaire, when he destroyed the Horams before them, from before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. And the Avams, which dwelt in Hazarim, even unto Azza, the Kaphtorims, which came from forth out of Kaphtor, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. These are all groups of, angel, these are all groups of, of, of um, giants that were destroyed. I think we'll finish up here with Og, king of Bashan. He was the giant king. Scott wishes he had a sword that big. But uh, he, was a, he was a giant king. And he's, he's not the only one, but he's one of the major ones that is talked about in the scriptures. Like, I mean, even his bed is talked about because they held his bed as a relic later on. Uh, they, years later, even thousands of years later, hundreds of years later, I think they had it. Uh, hundreds of years later, they had it. Now, Og, king of Bashan. For only, Deuteronomy 3.11, for only Og king of Bashan remained of the remnant of giants. Right? So in Bashan, in that area, he was the only one left there. His bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Robbeth of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. And we're going to show that. By the way, I want to stop you right there and, and have you think about this for a second. He said this for a reason. Giants aren't men. He didn't tell you to measure it after the cubit of a giant. He said, no, measure it after the cubit of a man. Giants, man. Different. No, the children of Amon didn't kill them. They were like gods over there. He was the king of Amon. He was the king of it. He was the king of those people over there, right, that, that was there at the time, right? So, for only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. All right, so he is nine cubits was the length thereof and four cubits the breadth of it after the cubit of a man. So, in other words, basically you see the difference here. Giants, man. They weren't human. And there's a reason why God is giving the difference of the two. And this land which we possessed at that time from Aor, which is by the river Arnon and, how, and half Mount Galad and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites and the rest of, the, of Galad and all Bashan, being the whole kingdom, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto half the tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob with all Bashan, which was called the land of Giants, whole land was filled with them. That's what they called it. When they looked at it, they called, oh, there's Og, king of Bashan. That, the whole land's full of giants. That's the land of the giants. See how this wasn't just some like local little small problem with a few giants running around? No, this was an entire land of them. Right? And he was the king. He was the boss. Right? Here we find... Here's Mount Hermon, right? This is the, the former territory of Og, king of Bashan. So this is in the blue here. This was what he ruled. And we don't have time to talk about this today, but, or we do have time to talk about this, Lord willing, this afternoon. But here's Mount Hermon, all right? Here's the Golan Heights, or here's the Golan, okay? Here's Ashtaroth. We know who that was named after, don't we? All right, here's the Jordan, here's Ramath Galad, okay? So here's, and here down here is the king, King Sion. Look where he was at. This was his kingdom, right? But Og's kingdom came all the way down and around there, so they were uh, close. Mount Hermon was a very wicked place. We won't really get into that too deeply, but, but it was. Uh, we'll talk about some of that this afternoon. But so you can see his kingdom was very large, and I don't think he took too kindly to losing that kingdom. Do you? It was a land of giants. He was not too happy about that. So he came to fight. And uh, the Israelites came to fight as well. Uh, 
which we'll find. Now, King's o King Og's bedstead of iron is an interesting bed. I'm going to give you the figures on that in our modern day uh, measurements. But his bedstead would be, if it was here today, it'd still be, it'd be probably one of those national wonders, okay, if it was around today. So we'll give you the numbers of it, but it was still kept in awe that children of Amon kept it, and they were like, man, this guy's bed's huge. We're going to keep this. It's like in a, it was like in a museum. I don't blame them, do you? Some guy slept in that. Something. Here it is, though. King Og's bed was nine cubits long and four cubits wide. A cubit is estimated at 1.5 feet conservatively. 13.5 feet long, so nearly 14 feet long. That's a big bed. Now, this is conservative. It could have been a little bigger than that. Could have been. I don't think it was any smaller than that because of a man's cubit. But, um, but some people talk about a royal cubit. They talk about a few different. So there's different sizes to that. So it could have been a little bit even bigger than that uh, as far as the cubit measurement that we've, we've tried to convert it to. Six feet wide. That's a big bed. And it was, why was it made of iron? It had to be. What else was going to hold him? <laughs> it's a big man. Could you imagine him rolling around that bed? I mean, it's six feet wide, right? So uh, 14, nearly 14 feet long. So his room had to be pretty good size, right? But he was a king, right? So he had a big bed. So he would say, well, that must be exaggerated. No, it wasn't exaggerated. Those measurements are given for a reason. Just like the measurements on the ark are given for a reason. They're explaining to you how big, how big he was. I don't have to explain away the giants. Well, how did that happen? Well, because evolution is not true. That's how it happened. See, in evolution, they have to deny all these facts. Why? Well, because we're getting better. Right? They, they have to deny all those things. Anyway. Uh, let's see. Let me see where I'm at here. I don't want to go any farther here. Let's see. Maybe a little bit farther. Maybe I'll go a little bit farther. Giants, okay, so more giants were in the land. Joshua chapter 12, verse number 1. Now these are the kings of the land, which the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side Jordan toward the rising of the sun, from the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon and all the plain on the east. Sion, he was another king. He was a giant. You'll, you'll notice that he was the giant that, 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 were with, that was with the Amorites, okay? Sion, king of the Amorites, who, who dwelt in Heshbon and ruled from Aror, which is upon the bank of the river Arnon, and from the middle of the river, and from half the Galad, even under the river Jabbok, which is in the border of the children of Ammon, and from the plain to the sea of Chinneroth on the east, and under the sea of the plain, even the salt sea on the east, the way to Beth, Bethel, Jeshemosh, and from the south under Ashdoth, Pisgah. See, Moses wiped them out. And why did Moses wipe out those, that giant that was the, in, the Amorite? Well, Amos chapter 2 tells us why. It goes on to explain when, when Israel went into the land, Amos tells us something that we didn't know about, about the Amorites is this. In Amos chapter 2, verse number 9 and 10, And yet destroyed I the Amorite, before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his root from beneath. Also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you forty years to the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. So Ah uh, or Bashan or excuse me, wrong guy. Uh, Sion, excuse me. Sion, he was the king of the giants too. He was a giant king, and he dwelt in the land. And he had an army of giants, right? And they were, the people were like the height of cedars. And he was strong as the oaks. Big guy. Right? And he was, what's that? Were you going to say something? Yeah, that's just made me think of behemoths. Right. Didn't something on behemoths were like cedars? Right. Explain to him a tail like a cedar or something like that. Is that what it was? Yep. Mm-hmm. Right, so, and, and that wasn't figurative. That was literal. He was saying, in that sense, he was saying that his tail was huge, 
right? He's, he's a big tail. And these men were huge, right? And this, these giants were huge, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his root from beneath. Also, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. You know, Moses, uh, Moses fought with the giants before. He fought before they went to the land. He fought with those on the other side of Jordan. That's, he wiped out those tribes of giants. Moses began to fight them when he was entered, before they entered the land. He went in there and he fought them, right? Moses did destroy them. Joshua 13, 12. And all the kingdom of Og and Bashan, which reigned in Ashtaroth. Look where, look where he reigned. What is that? Sons of God, daughters of men, right? You have the giants, you have the false uh, female deity, right? And you have Og, king of Bashan, which reigned in Adria, who remained of the remnant of the giants, for these did Moses smite and cast them out. Moses, that picture of the law, right? Moses is a picture of the law of God, and that's the law of God. And he came in and he wiped them out. He destroyed them right, from before their face. Moses was a very brave man, right? He had his faults and he had his problems, but Moses, he knew that he had to face the giants, right? Now, we're going to stop right here, I believe, because we're at right about an hour here. So we're, we're going to stop here uh, and we'll pick it up this afternoon because I want to I keep these to an hour long. And we're going to talk this afternoon about the Valley of the Giants. We're going to talk about the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, the picture of hell. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about some things that were going on, and then we're going to talk about the rest of, not all of them, but, but a number of giants, other giants, and the geography of the land that was set up around there. And the reason why is because there was a lot of demonic activity that was going on. There was devilish activity that was going on in that whole area. There's a purpose for why they all congregated around the Valley of the Giants. There was a reason, what, there was something about that place and a lot of things. So you'll learn a lot about that. Uh, this afternoon, you know, and but the question you want to ask yourself is, am I facing the giants? Am I battling the things that are in my life, the challenges that I have in my life? Am, am I fighting them or am I fighting those that are trying to help me? It's a good question, isn't it? It's something that we have to ask ourselves daily. You know, am I opposing, am I opposing my own self? Those Israelites, their, their greatest enemies were not those giants. They were already defeated in their mind, right? If you get defeated in your mind, right? The spirit of a man sustaineth his infirmity. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? You get wounded in your spirit, you defeat your own self, you get defeated in your mind, you won't even get up. I'm going to tell you what, I've seen people tell me they were allergic to Wi-Fi and they were allergic to everything and everything made them sick and they couldn't get up and work and they couldn't do anything, right? And they were just, you know, they, they, that they were in so much pain and agony and everything else. They were defeated in their mind. They just, they were basically going to sit on the couch and die until something, till, till God used something to make them rise up. Make them fight. Amen. God will do it too. God will cause something to rise up. Right? In you or in your house. Or if you get distracted, or if you're not fighting the fight that God wants you to fight, if you're not doing what God wants you to do, God will raise up things for you to war against, for, that, that'll war against you. God will raise things up so you pay attention to what God says. So you, you fight the good fight of faith. So you pay attention to his word. So you, so you pay attention to your life. So you face those giants that, that are in front of you. And you fight them. And you get the victory over them. And victory comes when you fight God's way, not when you fight your way. You don't get to invent the way to fight. God already has it right here in his word. Our spiritual warfare is determined. The, way, the rules are already determined in the scriptures, right? What do you think about that? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for its truths, Lord, that transcend all time. We thank you that it applies to us, Lord, in our situation, in our lives. Lord, we pray for those that are not saved, that they'd come to Christ and know him as Savior today. And Lord, we pray for those that are saved, 
that they would continue to fight the good fight of faith, that they would lay hold on eternal life, that they would war a good warfare. Lord, help us to face those giants. Help us to fight them. Help us to stand up in our lives for you. Help us to fight through our afflictions and our trials and our tribulations and our, the fiery trial which is to try us, though some strange thing happened unto us. Father, we need you. We don't need our, our own wisdom, but we need your wisdom. We need wisdom from above. Lord, help us, guide us, direct us, teach us, correct us, Lord. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Forgive us our failures. Forgive us our lack of drive, Lord, our complacency. Strengthen us. Teach us what we need to know, Lord. Bless the food that we have. Lord, bless it to our bodies. Bless the time we have together. Help us to cherish it, Lord, because in a moment it could all change. Help us to cherish the loved ones you've given us. Lord, help us to cherish this church that you've given us. One another, Lord, not to take for granted one another. Not to take for granted that God brought us all together. But to rejoice in it and to thank God for it. That he's given us brothers and sisters in Christ and he's given us life. Help us to be friendly. Help us to show ourselves friendly. Help us to be loving and Christ-like in all that we do. Strengthen our homes, our children, our marriages. Strengthen our walk with you. Thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.